That is my bad. I didn't start recording till just right now. I, it's a problem for turning off the recording. I shouldn't turn off the recording and turn it on. But we just did a few minutes of preview of the week two webpage and talking about exams. We'll do that again later in another day. So let's talk about a quick recap of slope fields before we move into the transition from slope fields to direction fields and read some notes covering sections 2, 1, 2, 2, and 2, 3. And I'll just over here, I'll put this note, exam one, distributed by 11.59. Thursday, June 3. So we'll talk about more about exam one later. I'm going to make some brief sketches on my paper. We've talked in chapter one about the universe of first order equations. The general first order equation where I describe slope as a formula based on the independent variable t and the dependent variable y. That's the rate of change of y with respect to t. This we called the general description of a first order initial value problem or first order differential equation, first order ordinary differential equation. But we covered three very special cases in chapter one that I just want to bring to your attention before we move on because we'll use them as analogies in the remainder of the course. The first was maybe the easiest, the closest to your calculus, calculus experiences. What if this problem here had no dependence on y? What if the derivative of y with respect to t depended only on the function of t? This was calculus one. Or integration in calculus two. You just integrate both sides and you find out what y is. And for that reason, the solutions only differed by a constant. And that means that slopes in such solutions were always constant on vertical lines. The slope on any vertical line was always the same. I didn't draw my picture very nicely there, but the slope on any vertical line was constant. And any vertical translation of a solution was still a solution. I should insert a fourth case here. I'll do that in a second. But then there was the case of no t influence. What if the f of t y had no t in it? This was called the autonomous case. It's closest resembling what we're going to do today. In this case, if the slope only depends on y, then for every y value, the slope will be the same no matter what the t value is. Changing the t value cannot change the slope. So it might be flat across the whole line. It might be up across the whole line. It might be down across the whole line. In that case, remember solutions are naturally vertical translations of each other. If you have a solution and you translate it vertically, it stays a solution because it still satisfies the slope field. So here slope field is constant on horizontal lines and horizontal translations of solutions are always solutions. We have the special solutions called equilibrium solutions in these cases. What's the next best step before I go to my fourth case here? Only depends on T. That's nice. Only depends on Y. That has nice property. What happens if 
it was a multiplication of something that depended on t by something that depended on y. This is what we called separable. And this was valuable because it meant that I was possibly two integrals away from a solution. But there was one more key case we studied in chapter one, and I want to highlight the power of the slope field in that case. And that was the linear equation, both homogeneous and non-homogeneous. I'm not gonna try to draw this because I won't draw it as neatly. I just barely drew these fairly. I won't draw it as neatly as I could here. But there's a special superpower of slope fields in this case. Remember, slope field's constant on horizontal lines. It's worth writing down. Sorry, vertical lines. Here's a slope field constant on horizontal lines. In the autonomous case. But in the linear case, homogeneous and then non homogeneous, slope fields have a distinctive shape. And solutions have a distinctive property. Let's first focus on the homogeneous case. In this case, slope fields can be vertically scaled. I'll show you what I mean by with a picture from the book. And multiples of solutions remain solutions. I'm gonna to have to pull this up as a picture of the book because he drew it nicer with the graphics in the book than I could draw it myself. So what I'm gonna do is get myself another screen, get myself a copy of the book, and then I'll share that picture with you. I'm talking about section 1, 8, and 1, 9 where we did linear equations, homogeneous and non-homogeneous. First, I'm talking about the homogeneous case. Table of contents. Chapter one, section one, eight, one, nine. I'm looking for a special picture and then I'll share the book with you. That's the picture I want. So let me go to the sharing, share, picture book, go over that screen, wrong screen, wrong screen. There we go. Okay, now you and I should be looking at the page of the book. This is section 1.8, linear equations, and this is on page 113. So here's what I mean by the special superpower of slope fields of a homogeneous linear equation, that scalings or multiples of solutions are solutions, and the slope field is scaled as you go up and down the vertical axis, not translated vertically, not translated horizontally, scaled. Let me do a super zoom on this picture right here. It looks like these slope lines are kind of chaotic and you don't see that scaling thing until you follow a solution. So here are five solutions to this problem. You know, like a solution, a solution times two, where everybody's twice as high, a solution times minus one, a solution times minus two, even a solution here times zero. So this is what I mean by multiples of solutions are solutions in the homogeneous case. How does that change when you go to the non-homogeneous problem? And I'm gonna to go to 
another picture farther down this section. And I'll expand that. It's almost the same in this non-homogeneous case. So here's a problem, dy dt is cosine ty, where they added a b of t. This is a non-homogeneous problem. So what happened here is that this caused the slope field to be tilted or slightly adjusted. And so I can't say multiples of solutions are solutions in the classical sense, but I can still say that the homogeneous multiples of solutions are translated into solutions in the non-homogeneous problem. So if I go quickly to this drawing, I cannot say that these five blue solutions are multiples of each other because they're both multiples and tilting and adjusted by the B of T. So this is what I wanted to say on the paper in this kind of a recap of chapter one. And I'm gonna go back to my paper now. Okay, got it. And excuse me, I gotta make sure my paper is posted. If you are here in the session with me, you're seeing the paper. If I don't pin it, then I don't record the paper. So I wanna make sure I'm recording the paper for you. So this is the brief recap of chapter one. The special cases of a first order equation and the function that describes a slope field. The general case, any messed up combination of t's and y's. The integral case, some people call this the integral case because it's closest to calc one and calc two, where you just integrate once and you find out what y is. All solutions are vertical translations of each other. The autonomous case, where you can still separate and integrate twice and you will get all solutions are horizontal translations of each other. The separable case, which can be more complicated, but still is just two integrals away from your solution. And then the last case we talked about, which we'll expand on in chapter three much greater, called the linear case, homogeneous and non-homogeneous. And here, in the homogeneous case, slope fields are vertical scalings of each other and multiples of solutions are still solutions. And in the non-homogeneous case, then we also include translation of solutions. But I wanna be very cautious about how I use that word translation. So, uh, I'm just previewing something for later, okay? So now let's go to our notes today and get rolling. I'm gonna to go to the screen. I'm gonna see if I'm on the screen I want to be on. So I'm coming over here, got it. Managing too many screens, I apologize. Okay, so if everything's working out right here, then you are observing my screen, that's okay. Uh, let me get rid of the message. You, you know, you're literally observing my screen, so even behind the scenes, I just have things prepared that I want you to see here. And I wanna see if this recording is kind of too expensive or too large to be manageable when I post it later. So let's open up section 2.1, modeling with systems. We did give you an example of a system in the very first chapter, the predator-prey system, but now we're gonna go more intensely into that system. So I'm gonna expand my notes and do some reading with you. So we've finished the basic tools in chapter one and we got to expand to problems that we can address with analogies to the chapter one tools. So here's a simple predator prey model. What I have right here is, let's just casually call them rabbits and foxes. Do you notice that the rabbits, without any foxes present, let's say all F was zero, would grow exponentially. And if all R was zero, the 
Fox, rate of change would be negative. They would decay. The interaction of the rabbits and foxes introduces this term, R times F. So if R and F are both positive, there will be a detracting from the growth of rabbits and there'll be an enhancing of the growth of foxes. But what's really interesting to note in this equation is if you can factor out both terms, the dr dt and df dt, you have a common factor of r, you have a common factor of f. If I just take out a 2r and a minus f, just to remind myself of the exponential growth and exponential decay, look at what's left right there. 1 minus 3 fifths f, 1 minus 9 tenths r. So this is a system we call a first order system because it only uses one derivative in each case. But how do the rabbits and foxes interact? Let's talk about equilibrium solutions, like we talked about in the autonomous case. This is an autonomous system because neither dr dt nor df dt depend on time. Well, autonomous system, equilibrium solutions, is there any moment when there is no rabbit growth and no fox growth? And that's simple enough. What if there were no rabbits or no foxes? So I might highlight some things here once in a while. If there are no rabbits and no foxes on the island, then there never will be any rabbits or foxes on the island, <coughs> unless some external event happens, which we're discounting. But that's an equilibrium solution. Neither population will change with time. But we're interested to see if it's only the equilibrium solution. Are there any other points? And let's look at these two equations. Could these two equations be simultaneously zero? Well, you could have R and F both be zero, but you could have these other factors wipe out both equations too. Do you see these other factors the way they're presented? If F is 5 thirds, then the first factor in the second factor in the first equation is zero. If r is 10 ninths, then the second factor in the second equation is zero. And that means if there are 5 thirds foxes and 10 ninths rabbits, that's an equilibrium point. Now, remember, scaling is completely up to us. So I don't mean one and one ninth rabbits. However I measure rabbits, is it 10 ninths trucks of rabbits? Is it 10 ninths dozens of rabbits? Is it 10 ninths kilograms of rabbits? I'm free to assign the units I want, so don't be put off by the fractions right here. Okay, so these two fixed points, if I'm ever in those two states, I will never leave those states. These are two fixed points of the system, and they're like equilibrium solutions in first order autonomous equations. Now, is there anything else we can pick off really easily from those two equations? Remember, I've always already mentioned that if there are no foxes on the island, there never will be. And the fox population is very easy to describe, zero. Rabbit population is constant times e to the 2t. And it'll be a positive constant if I put a positive number of rabbits on the island. Today, let's only talk about positive or zero rabbits, positive or zero foxes. Let's not talk about negative rabbits and foxes today. We might go back to that later. What if there are no rabbits on the island? Well, then the system reduces to just df dt is minus f, and the rabbit population will always be zero, and the fox population will be decaying exponentially. Now, here's the leap we're going to make from chapter one and the concept of phase line. I have a rabbit in equation and a fox equation. In a sense, I have two phase lines. What happens if there are no rabbits? Do you see this vertical axis? Fox population decays to zero. What about the horizontal axis, the rabbit axis? What happens if there are no foxes? The rabbit population grows without bound. We put down our two equilibrium points, and then we try to discuss what's going to happen from here. But think of this as a bathtub with two walls and no walls 
above or to the right. And think of these phase lines that I've joined at the origin, a fox phase line and a rabbit phase line, as making what we're going to call a phase plane. This is a very important terminology, phase plane. It's a plane where the action happens. What action do we think is going to happen right here? I think I'm going to clear that blue box and say, what would happen, change colors, if I followed a rabbit and fox experiment on this island? And I already drew this curve for you. Let's say if I start right here with very little rabbits and quite a few foxes. Foxes are going hungry, foxes are dying out, but rabbits with less and less foxes will tend to increase. The rabbits increase far enough, then the fox population will start to pick up. The fox population picks up, that acts as a curb, that acts as a curb on the rabbit population. Fox population might increase for a while, but the rabbit population is decreasing. Sooner or later, if the fox population gets too high and they've hunted all the rabbits, then the fox population will start to decrease. Now the question here is, what should I say about this behavior? Is it cycling? Is it gonna reconnect and go in an eternal cycle? Or perhaps is it going to spiral in, possibly spiral out? I'm not sure yet, and that's why I'll appeal to a graphical representation. I'll appeal to a numerical analysis. But I want you to think like this. This is like you when you sat in the bathtub when you were a kid. And what did you do when you sat in the bathtub when you were a kid, or maybe it was just me? You paddled the heck out of the water in that bathtub, right? So you could create a swirling whirlpool so you're pet dolphin or your pet battleship or whatever you had your little brother in the bathtub would go swirling around in a whirlpool right that's the pressure of the fox population to be declining combined with the pressure of the rabbit population to increase it naturally creates the environment for a cycle possibly a cycle i clear that drawing so we're going to roll to some graphics and see what I can make out of that. But I also want you to notice it's not just the equilibrium points or the phase lines that's important to us. I can check tendency of motion at any point. For example, if R and F were one and one, or if R and F were two and two, I can insert those into the equations and get what? A tendency of R, a growth rate of R, a growth rate of F, and I could look at their respective ratio. I could compare the growth rate of R to the growth rate of F. For example, at 1, 1, and then create a picture. I have the rabbits growing at 8 tenths, whatever those units are. The fox is declining at 1 tenth. That's an 8 to 1 ratio of rabbit growth to fox decline. But on the other hand, at 2, 2, I have rabbit growth minus four fifths, fox growth eight fifths. That's a two to one ratio of fox growth to rabbit decline. What am I describing when I say eight to one or four to eight, and I include the minus signs and talk about this ratio? What I'm describing is a vector. There's the vector minus four fifths, eight fifths. Notice it's sitting at two, two. The vector, eight fifths, four fifths, notice that's sitting at two, one. Here's a vector right here, eight tenths over, one tenth down. Notice that's sitting at one, one. Now these vectors look like a little random or chaotic. Sure they are, but they do tend to reinforce the fact that I'm spiraling around this equilibrium point at 10 ninths and 5 thirds. I can do lots and lots of vectors like this, but we've already played this game. We're not going to do lots and lots of vectors by ourselves. We're going to let machines do lots and lots of vectors. Notice the vector length here 
probably indicates the strength of the flow or how fast the current is going. A short vector means that current's not very fast at that moment, but a longer vector means current is relatively fast. The links tell you the magnitude of the movement. Well, let's graduate to machine-based drawing. So here is the same system drawn in a slope field. No, no, no. Now I'm going to call it direction field because I have two competing directions, a rabbit direction and a fox direction. They both could go up or down. And although the arrows are suppressed and the magnitudes are suppressed in this picture, this is what we call picture of a direction field. It tells us the direction of the flow if we included the arrows, but it strips out the magnitude information so that the drawing doesn't look too crazy and cluttered. Okay, so what do I see in this? I see that returning and cycling that I wondered if what was going to happen. I could draw a lot of arrows, I could have a program draw a lot of arrows, and now I have a strong feeling that these rabbits and foxes on this island will eternally cycle. Rabbit population going up and down, fox population going up and down, not at the same time, both up, but kind of out of phase. Now this thing that I've drawn right here on the right-hand side, it's just an image in my scanned paper, is called a phase portrait. Let's get our terminology straight. Phase plane is the place where the action happens. Phase portrait is the action that's happening in the phase plane. And by that, I mean that apparently this problem is simple enough that it can be completely described by two equilibrium solutions two straight line solutions, and one notion called cycling. These red drawing curves are enough to tell you everything that's happening in the system. You say, oh, but you could draw another cycle right here. Well, sure I could. But would it tell you anything different than the previous cycle? You can just barely make out some arrows on this cycle right here. Would this smaller cycle tell you anything that the larger cycle did not? No, it just indicates a different starting point possibly. I could have a much larger cycle. I could have a much smaller cycle. But apparently what's happening in this problem is eternal cycling. Okay, I'm going to clear that drawing. Let's try another problem. But start by getting this very clear at the beginning. Phase plane is where the action's happening. The XY plane, the RF plane, the UV plane, whatever variable's using. Phase portrait is a picture of what's happening, a representative sample of all the solutions, types that are possible in that problem. Now let's modify, let's modify, excuse me, the parallel prey problem by same parallel prey problem we began with a second ago, but now I'm going to put a carrying capacity on the rabbits of two. Notice that changes my factors, but I can still search for the moment where both R and F are zero. Again, if R is zero, that wipes out the whole first equation and most of the second equation. I just have decaying foxes. But what if F is zero? I have more action on the rabbits. I have exponential growth of rabbits, sure, but up to a carrying capacity. So rather this is logistic growth, right? So I can take these four factors and pair them. When are the first two factors both zero? When are the last two factors both zero? When is the first and last factor both zero? When is the last and first factor both zero? I have four ways I could score with 
no rabbit growth and no fox growth. And I solve these and I get an equilibrium point at zero, zero. I get an equilibrium point at two, zero. And I get an equilibrium point now at 10 ninths and 20, 27 I'll let you solve those equations simultaneously zero. Literally, they're just two lines. I can draw my two phase lines, right? Phase line for the rabbits when there are no foxes. Phase line for the foxes when there are no rabbits. Fox phase line is the same, but the rabbit phase line now has a carrying capacity of two, decaying two, two or growing two, two from below. Let's glue those two phase lines together. And then let's run a simulation. Now you notice I've added an equilibrium point. I'm still in my giant swirling bathtub, right? I have equilibrium points about where they were before. This one's a little bit lower. Here's a new equilibrium point. And what does that new equilibrium point do? It acts as a block or a wall. It's kind of, do you see that? It's a pressure driving rabbits down to two. I didn't label scale here. So this is like what? You're pumping, swirling, 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 paddling in the bathtub to make that whirlpool. But then you stop and you block it with your dolphin, battleship, teddy bear, little brother, whatever. And now what happens to that eternal cycling? Well, I am still trying to cycle, right? I release something here with a certain number of rabbits and lots of foxes. Well, they start consuming rabbits. I start to go down. And as the foxes go down, the rabbits start to recover. But now what's happening is the rabbits recover. They start to feel this pressure at two. They're not gonna recover as far as they want to. They're gonna recover and have pressure to stay below two. So they're gonna cycle all right, but they're gonna cycle and go back in a smaller magnitude cycle. They're going to spiral to the equilibrium point. Now I overemphasize the spiral right there. The actual spiral you actually see on this direction field. Remember direction field is showing both slopes at once and I've stripped out the magnitude of the vector information so I can just focus on the direction things flow. So what I see here are three equilibrium solutions, three straight line solutions, foxes down, rabbits up, rabbits down, I have two different straight line solutions for rabbits. And then those things dictate that all the other solutions, every single one will spiral to this equilibrium point in the middle of the field. That's interesting. Do you see that? The equilibrium points are like controlling the behavior. I think I'm gonna go on some giant eternal cycle. Well, I didn't draw that nicely. Let me try to draw it again. I think I'm going on some giant eternal cycle. But as I round the corner, I hit the wall. I feel the pressure that says rabbits are constrained by carrying capacity. Then I have to turn around and repeat my cycle, but now at a smaller magnitude. Every solution is doomed to spiral to the equilibrium point. That's interesting. Now notice what we're doing here is called qualitative analysis. I haven't done any calculation. The only calculation I've had here is a machine doing a calculation and that's a numerical analysis, right? I don't have any prayer that I can describe the equation of that curve basically. But I just want you to feel that curve. Okay, we're gonna take a break in a second, but let's hit a couple more highlights. 
So again, the type of picture that I'm presenting here on the right, the qualitative analysis that I just did, is called a phase portrait. A phase portrait is a complete accounting of all possible types of solutions in the phase plane. This territory is called the phase plane, but this red notations on the phase plane is the phase portrait. Should I add some more spirals? No, they all look like this one, bigger or smaller. This spiral tells the story. These straight lines tell the story. These dots, the equilibrium points tell the story. In fact, it's almost as if you have a sneaking suspicion that actually the dots are dictating what's happening in this picture. So we're gonna explore that as we go along. So make sure you do not confuse phase plane with phase portrait. Phase plane is where the action happens. Phase portrait is what the action is. Let's do one more quick example visually, and then we'll take a break. And here's the most famous example, almost in all of engineering, certainly mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, even civil engineering, but everywhere in engineering in general concept of the harmonic oscillator. So let's describe a simple harmonic oscillator where I place a mass on the end of a spring and if the mass is at rest on a frictionless surface and the spring is fixed to a wall, then the mass will never move from that point. But if I compress, if I push the mass to the left, then I will be storing energy in the spring and the spring will want to push back. Or if I pull the mass over to the right, then I will be stretching out the spring and the spring will want to pull it back. The spring will want to oppose the force that I'm applying. Now, it depends on how you've studied masses and springs before. If you have at all, maybe you've thought of things vertically. The author has a purpose for doing this horizontally, so I just want you to be flexible. Let's set up our situation. Where the mass would sit at rest, we're called at the equilibrium position. We're going to use Y for position, even though we're on a horizontal scale. To the left, we'll say that Y is negative, and to the right, we'll say the Y is positive. So when I compress the spring, Y is negative, and when I expand the spring, Y is positive. The next thing I'm gonna do is talk about the positive constants M and K. I require that M and K are both positive. You're used to positive mass. You've never met something that has a negative mass, or at least you probably haven't, or maybe the physicists will argue about this. But the K constant is called the stiffness of the spring. That is also a natural, positive constant. It's inherent to the spring. The stiffness of the springs on your car's suspension is a huge number. And the stiffness of the spring in a mechanical watch is a very small number. It's very flexible, easily stretched. And move on down the page here. So M represents mass, K represents what physicists call the stiffness of the spring. And by some standard physics, if we displace the mass from the origin, it will slide back and forth on this frictionless surface forever. And the way that it slides is governed by a differential equation, very simply Newton's law that says, if an object is accelerating, it must be experiencing a force and vice versa. If you apply a force to an object, you will accelerate it. And the force, is proportional to the acceleration, vice versa. But in this case, the only force acting on the mass, since it's a frictionless table, is what's called Hooke's law, the restoring force of the spring. If you pull one way, the spring pulls the other. And again, proportionally. So since Hooke's law is the only force acting on the spring, then the sum of all forces, m times a, is equal to the restoring force of the spring minus k times y. So we have our first second order differential equation, m times d squared y dt squared, second derivative of y with respect to t, 
plus ky is zero. Why am I bringing this up now? What does that have to do with systems? Well, if you make a tiny substitution here, and you've done this in your physics class, let's create a letter called V and assign V to the first derivative of Y. You know V stands for velocity. The first derivative of velocity, the second derivative of position is called acceleration A. Then this equation can be writ rewritten instead of MA plus KY is zero, M dV dt equals minus K over MY. I'm allowed to divide by M because M is not zero. No zero masses in this class. So if you combine this substitution, dy dt is v and dv dt is minus k over m, you created a first order system, not like rabbits and foxes, but in a funny way, surprisingly similar. It has one equilibrium solution at the origin. It has no straight line solutions. And if you plug this into a machine, and looked at some numerical pictures, this is what you see. Position on the horizontal axis, velocity on the vertical axis. And as you release that mass, you know there will be an eternal cycling of the mass about the equilibrium position, sometimes with greater displacement, sometimes with less, sometimes with greater velocity, sometimes with less. The blue and black curves are velocity and displacement. At first you say, what does that have to do with predator prey? But then I say to you, but isn't that exactly what you saw in predator prey? Now you had another equilibrium solution down here, but you had this eternal cycling. In the mass spring, in the harmonic oscillator, this eternal cycling is easily described with sine and cosine wave in this example. The rabbit fox, description is not so simple. You could not give me the equations for these blue and black curves. Okay, that is section two one. And I wanna say more about these two pictures on the screen in front of you, but first we're gonna take a break. And I'm gonna say what the purpose of section two one was to introduce systems, introduce terminology, face plane, face portrait and get you ready to think about this new medium called direction field, where chapter one was focused on slope field. So I'm gonna stop share on this. I'm gonna say, let's come back at 107. Stretch your legs. I'm gonna mute my microphone and stretch my legs. And then we'll come back and show you other wonderful things. Notice we've done nothing analytically yet.
Okay, let's come back and continue our discussion. These handwritten notes that I've placed in front of you today, remember these are available on our website and I will go back and show you where they are on our website. In case you're missing that, remember we have resources, we have handouts, and under handouts, these are my personal lecture notes. So if I click on two one, those are the notes that we just read. And we're gonna do some more reading now in two two and two three. But first I thought I'd show you where I got some of these graphics because you're going to need to create these graphics yourself in your homework problems this week. So I'm gonna stop sharing. Well, before I do that, back down to technology at the very bottom. Well, let me not, it's of course on the resources page, but let's go back to our week two page, week two technology, Mathematica, the notebook called First Order Systems. Okay, let's open up that notebook and play with it. So, <coughs> excuse me, stop sharing, go back to our paper. What's remarkable about these two sets of curves? Do you notice blue and black? One represents position, one represents velocity. Can you tell which is which? Now you see the velocity, if I drew this to scale, I drew this in a square scale, I have position taking wide swings out past two, nearly to three, velocity not swinging above plus or minus two. So already you say, oh, the blue curve is position, the Y curve is velocity, or the black curve is velocity. How does that appear in the rabbit fox case? Because they both seem to be swinging kind of roughly between zero and four, right? How do you tell which one's a rabbit and which one's a fox is in this case? Well, one dips lower than the other and possibly that's the rabbits. You see the rabbits come closer to zero than the foxes ever do. So maybe rabbits is blue, but there's a much better reason. Look at the blue curve. Let's assume it's rabbits. What's happening to foxes when rabbits are at their highest? Look at that growth rate of the foxes on the potential black curve. The growth rate of the foxes is huge. It is in fact maximum, maximum slope for foxes. Let's try maximum value of foxes. If I have the most foxes possible, what's happening to rabbit growth? It's tanking. Rabbit growth is going way, way down. What happens when fox is at the lowest point? then rabbits are growing as fast as they can. What happens when rabbits are at their lowest point and foxes are going way, way down? So even if you didn't have the blue and black clue, even if you didn't have this cycle and see the physical separation from the axes, you could decide here quickly that blue is rabbits and black is foxes. Well, let's show this to you live. So I'm gonna go back to Mathematica notebook. Oh, I'm, I'm trying to manage the screen sharing here. So apologize for my lack of facility. There's my desktop. I want to look at this Mathematica notebook here called First Order Systems. It's on a website, but I just have a version here on my desktop so I didn't have to download it. I expand this for you. And then I might isolate this to make the images easier to consume or faster to consume. So I'm going to first blow up this type here so it's a little bit larger. And then I think I will share just the screen. So what do we got here? First order systems where you can type in your own systems. I could type in the rabbit fox system later if you like. But let's just make up two equations. F is y squared minus x. G is one plus y minus x squared. You can literally type in the formulas of your systems here. 
Notice you have to use the correct syntax and so forth. If you're working with Mathematica and you're getting an error or a non-response, most likely it's a syntax error. I hit shift enter and the machine processes those two assignments without responding to me. Now I've set up something that's gonna draw streamlines, a vector field and put them together, streamlines and vector fields. So I created a variable called streamlines with a stream plot function. I created a variable called field with a vector plot function. I tend to put things on different lines as I enter the arguments or the functions. And I wanna say something about my X, X, extra arguments like stream points and vector scaling now. But let's assign these two variables and then show the streamlines and the vector plot together. Here it is. Here's a direction field. A little bit of chaos, a little bit of beauty, a little bit of order, but solutions seem to be coming in from the upper left. And either they gently veer around the lower left, or they take a big loop around the upper right. Now this is just a random direction field I picked out, probably some problem in the book, but this differential system might be hard for me to understand. So the visuals do what? The visuals tell me what's happening. The visuals tell me the flow in the phase plane. This is not a phase portrait yet because I think I need to examine everything that's happening in here. And we're not gonna examine this one that closely. What do you think is happening in this eye right here? Cycling around this eye? Maybe there's a stable point in there. Maybe there's an equilibrium solution. I could pick some more extreme curves and see if I can generate them. But notice, let me take and set this example equal to yeah, let's set an example around that I and see if we can say, let's say two and one. Let's make my initial condition two and one here. Yeah, I'm cycling around possibly an equilibrium solution. Is the field distracting you? Let's remove the field. I'm cycling possibly around an equilibrium solution. Let me put back the field with the comma. Let's try something really extreme, like how about going through minus one and zero, because I want to do a quick bending loop. Let's see how that looks. See, I can explore different solutions here. Yeah, that's almost taking a deep bend in there. I could possibly go deeper. How about zero and minus one half? I'm just exploring with you or demonstrating how I could explore on this worksheet. Oh, that's interesting. Let's erase the field so that I could just look at that loop. That's a funny loop, isn't it? It's taken a big tuck past the origin here, past the turning point, and then it goes around that equilibrium and comes back out the other side. Let's add some points here. And you know, I know you're asking the question like, what, what's, where's the red thing, Dave? Why isn't this red? I'll explain that in a second. But let's add that point through two and one that we tried a second ago. And then let's add a point that dips down below here. How about through like minus two minus one? Look at that. Now I'm telling a story about this system. Maybe one more point going broadly around. How about through minus two and three? So I'm not writing these commands. I'm using the commands that I've already written in here. You can practice writing your own commands too, but you could also use that. Okay, I, look, I took a too, too generous loop and it went off screen. Let's uh, do minus two and two. 
I'm just trying to do what? Be descriptive. There we go. How about this? Is this the story of this system? Is this all possible solutions? In one way, it kind of is, except I haven't found the equilibrium solution yet. But I could set those two equations equal to each other, find the equilibrium solution. Why can I do that? Because this is just x equals y squared sideways parabola. This is y equals x squared minus 1 if you set them both equal to 0. That's a frontways parabola. I can imagine where the parabolas intersect. I could solve them. OK, let's put my field back. But you see, as you add more elements, sometimes it gets cluttered. Let's take out the streamlines. You see where we were? We're looking at this swirling pool of water and trying to decide what's happening. But with a little bit of experimenting, we have described kind of all the things that are happening. You can have more details if you like, but if I put that dot in the middle, this would be pretty much a legitimate phase portrait, a description of everything that's happening. Let's go on. Now, what if I wanted to say, these are parametric curves. How do these X of T and Y of T solutions are? Let's pick out this one, this crazy one that took that sharp tuck vertical right here. What point was that? That was zero and minus one half. I'm sorry if I'm making you dizzy. Let's put the machine fully to work. Let's use the numerical differential equation solver with the system defined by the functions f and g at the beginning of the sheet. And now let's go through the point zero and minus one half. And let's see if the computer could approximate that curve right here in the middle. Uh, time allowed, we might have to be flexible on that, but I'm gonna take a small time interval just to get started. After I do that numerical solution, remember it's called solution, I assign it to the x and y coordinates and I plot like this. There is the x and y motion of that crazy curve that tucked vertical. Now, if you want, I can put them side by side. Oops, I did not do, that's not, that one didn't tuck so crazy. Let's do this one at zero and minus one half. There, that curve is, okay, I'm not getting the second curve in there, excuse me. I gotta put in the initial place. I gotta put in the initial value at each place, sorry. So I've done a little bit of overkill on the prep here. So it means I have to adjust several places. Let's try it again. Okay, there's that curve that tucks in. There's these funny things here. And you say, whoa, 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 no, no, no. Uh, X might be getting larger as we go along, but Y is not. What's going on here? Well, that blue and black wiggle right here could be going around the equilibrium point. What's happening here at about three and a half seconds? I got two options. Either I'm not showing a big enough window, or I may not have done enough in the numerical solver. Remember, I only ran the numerical solver for two and a half seconds. Let's adjust that to five and a half seconds. Okay, now I got more truth. Numerical solver, very cool, but you have to be very specific about the interval you require. Notice Mathematica gives you a warning. Something's happening at five seconds. It looks like something crazy happening. Am I going vertical here, or vertical here? Is it backtracking? I'm not sure. But at least I have some rough idea. I'm going to take out the field and just show you the loop and curve. 
Do you know, notice how I'm defining things? Streamlines, fields, solution one, and then I put them together in a show command. That allows me to have control over what I show you and what I don't show you. Do you see, and I've made this point once already, inside the braces where I put the phase plane and the individual solutions, that put the two graphs side by side in brackets. I hardly see the brackets, but I like the two graphs side by side. Okay, this is where you're gonna roll with some of your problems this week. You can literally take your dx dt and plug it into the function f, dy dt and plug it into the function g, or dr dt, df dt, or du db, dv dt, whatever, I can't even pronounce it. Just using the correct syntax, making the correct adjustments. Now, I wanna make a small concept about my worksheets here that in some sense need review. So notice how these vectors are colored, even though they have different directions and all the same magnitude, they're colored. Mathematica is trying to tell me the hotter colors mean the faster movement. These would be longer vectors. But what's happening with this red thing? I don't have any of these guys coming out red. In fact, I have them colored by faster and slower. Darker is slower, purple a little bit faster, coming in very fast. Well, the issue is here that what I've done is using previous worksheets, when Mathematica gets updated, then it easily surpassed things that it used to do. So this is no longer how you color solutions in Mathematica. And this vector scale argument is really not even necessary right there. If I take out the vector scale small, tiny, none, let's see what happens. Sorry. I got to put back the field. Okay, I get some arrows going on here. Maybe a little bit too busy, but you see the arrows color themselves and the arrowheads are pointing in the correct direction. What if I adjusted the stream points? Let's take out the red, the red. I could actually get streamlines to have the color I want them. Let's keep, leave this one in red. Inside the double braces, I got to erase the other double braces. Got it, got it, go. That didn't turn anything red because Mathematica has a new function called stream color function. And if I set stream color function equal to none, then let me get rid of the field. Then I can specify the color of any stream I want to specify by wrapping the point in another set of braces and including a color. Let's make one of these black. Mathematica has some standard colors. You can specify colors in other ways. Okay, now I got this little eye going black. Now that's not enough of a session on Mathematica, but at least it gives you an idea of what you could do. If you're trying to do things Maybe you should remove some of the fanciness I had in the arguments to vector plot, stream plot. Why? Because Mathematica has surpassed the way I used to write them. This grid lines feature right here, I put in to show you how to draw grid lines. On the x-axis, I do grid lines at every unit from minus four to four. On the y-axis, I do grid lines every unit minus four to four. But I did it by making a list of the numbers from minus four to four in what you call a table. Again, that's a little more advanced. I could entirely take out these graph, uh, these grid lines and it wouldn't damage my drawing. I just sometimes like to look at grid lines, right? So I want you to get into some heavy experimenting. You really need it with these systems this week. 
So jump into this Mathematica notebook, first order systems. Uh, sorry, mine right here. Let me go back to screen sharing. Mine right here says first order systems class session because this is just a local version of that notebook. It's not the one I downloaded off the website because I didn't want to have any lag and downloading issues. So you go look at this notebook called First Order Systems. It looks exactly like I have here, except for the title. And you play with these things to create your slope fields this week. Okay, let's open up section two. So section two, I also want to walk through my handwritten notes here with you. And just let me see, I'm going to share that page specifically with you. Yeah, I don't mind the screen sharing. It might be nice to share two things at once. Uh, it's a little too much hopping around. So let's think about these direction fields more carefully. Is it legal for us to do this? Is the computer actually doing legitimate calculations? We hope they're legitimate. They certainly look pretty. So remember, in the previous section, we started with a simple predator-prey model, which meant cycling. And we plotted the solutions to that system. We'll show you the pictures again. But what we were plotting is solutions in the plane, right? We were plotting rabbit population, fox population. In a sense, if you put the rabbit population and fox population together in one box or container, it's just the generic population vector. And the rate of change of that population vector, drdt, dpdt, that itself is a vector. I'm using that word vector. Where did you hear that word vector? Calculus three. You learned that you could do everything you did in calculus, but do it on vectors by doing what? Your vector calculations, your differential calculus, your integral calculus, one slot at a time. So the derivative of vector is the derivative of each slot of the vector. In that sense, I could think of the field as a vector field. In Calc 3, you said vector in, vector out. That's a vector field. So I take a rabbit fox location, I put it into my vector field, I get out this vector itself, which describes the tendency of the rabbits and foxes, which we showed you in the picture. We'll go back to the picture in a second. But first I wanna just look at the notation. From left to right, let's unwrap this. The rate of change of population is the rate of change of a population vector, which is the vector of the rates of change of the populations which were both described by their own separate functions, which formed a vector field, which is a vector field for any population combination I set. Look at the first and the last expression here. All I did was say dp dt is v of p. What is that? In chapter one, take off the arrow hats. You call that an autonomous first order equation. Now we call it an autonomous first order system. It looks shockingly close. Get rid of the box. Sorry. <laughs> Have to get rid of the box legally. Look at them side by side. The system where I write the components separately and the system where I write the components economically. There's no difference between these two presentations. I'm just on the right hand side, focusing more on the concept. On the left hand side, focusing more on the details. The R and the F are the components of the population. And these functions for DRDT and DFTV are the results of the vector field on that population vector. 
Let's look at this quickly. Doesn't that notation look exactly like we used to call first order Thomas equations? And here I'm using generic letters, capital Y for vector, little x, little y. Remember, I can use any letters I like. Yes, it looks very much like. Well, what is our hope then? Our hope is everything that was true about this. Can it also be true about this? Can we take all the truth from the left side and transfer it into truth on the right side? The answer is thankfully, miraculously, yes. Before I move on, I want to erase this. Now you could be dazed by vectors right now. It's been a long time since you opened up a vector. Maybe, maybe not. But I want to at least give you some perk. As it happens in this course, we never have to describe anything but two-dimensional vectors. That is vectors in the plane. Although you can go to three dimensions and higher. Maybe we'll show you one example. Maybe, probably not. Two dimensions is good enough to describe everything that's important to us, actually for quite some time. You're gonna to have to get into a specialized course such like fluid dynamics or such before you've got to really seriously think about three dimensions. Even electromagnetics, if you remember your physics class, a lot of drawings are two dimensional because the third dimension usually ends up sucking up a lot of symmetry, right? I'm, I don't know physics, so don't trust anything I say about physics, but I wanna at least put your mind at ease. We are talking about two dimensional fields in this class. It's pretty much all we're going to look at. So from now on, we're gonna be flexible to write vectors either as columns or ordered pairs. Try to indicate vectors with arrow hats. You've talked about vectors of columns, vectors of ordered pairs, vectors of pointy brackets. I don't mind how you do it, but most often we're gonna be talking about columns or ordered pairs. The positive part of working with these vectors is we can think of all the knowledge we gained about vector fields in the previous class and all the knowledge we gained about first order equations in the first chapter to put them together. So now I think about this predator prey problem. I showed you this out picture in the first hour minus the extra cycles. I think about it as motion in a vector field. And this motion in a vector field is a legitimate interpretation. Good. Let's go back to the simple harmonic oscillator that we opened up last time. Now this is motion in a vector field. And if I play with the K and the M, the picture changes exactly how I expect it to change. Let's think about this. This is very qualitative now, so no equations yet. Let's say K over M was one to four. In that sense, the mass is outpacing the stiffness. Now mass units are different than stiffness units. So I'm not saying that mass is four times K, but let's say the ratio of K to M was one to four. Let's say the object was much more massive than the spring was stiff. Then as you wave that heavy rock on the end of the slinky, what happens? Big displacement back and forth and relatively slow motion, not a high velocity. But if you turn it around and said the spring was stiff and the mass was not that great, so let's say four to one ratio the other way, now you've got a very tight spring and not too heavy mass. And when you let that wave up and down, what do you get? Like very fast oscillations, relatively fast oscillations. Displacement is relatively small, horizontal axis. Velocity is larger, the thing is moving faster. What if you would get if it was more balanced? Well, probably a little bit more balancing between displacement and velocity in the middle picture. I'm solving no equations, right? But I'm talking to you about your vector and intuition and your physical knowledge. 
So second order equation, remember this is our first second order equation, simple harmonic oscillator with a substitution, V equals dy dt becomes a first order system. Always display first order system by writing both equations together. You see that I've offset the V and the Y here. Maybe we'll talk about that later. That's not as essential. Okay, let's go to the modified predator prey problem that we introduced last hour. Do you see now I'm bringing you several solutions of streamlines in this picture? But they do all seem to be coalescing on this equilibrium point that we discovered was 10 ninths and 20 27s. Is everything predator prey? No, not at all. Here's another interesting system. Look at this system before you read the words. Of course, too late, you've already read the words, competing species. What do I have here? Two species, not rabbits or foxes, but let's call them X's and Y's. Notice a carrying capacity on the X's, a carrying capacity on the Y's. And notice that the presence of the other detracts from the growth of the one you're examining. Both times, the presence of the other detracts from the growth of the other. See, presence of one detracts from the growth of the other. What's happening here? This is not one species eating the other species. This is two species possibly competing for an external resource. Two types of bugs in the cornfield, uh, two types of strains of a virus. When one wins, the other loses, possibly. But what do I have? Carrying capacity and both being detracted. What is that going to do to the direction field? Notice the direction field is radically different. I display my equilibrium solution at zero, zero, of course. And then I can find two other equilibrium solutions by factoring and solving these combinations of four factors. How do I make both zero? Any combination of these four factors will do. But now this equilibrium solution at one, one is kind of like a border or a deciding place between the survival of the two species, a little bit above one, one. And we peel off to the upper left. What does that mean? Species Y stabilizes at three, species X stabilizes at zero. What does that mean? Species Y one. On the other side though, slightly lower, species X stabilizes at its carrying capacity of two, species Y stabilizes at zero. Species X one. But the difference between winning and losing, when you first set these bugs out in that field, was razor thin. You know, there's like a dividing line between species Y winning naturally and species X winning naturally. These are called competing species. Just showing you some of the things that could happen. So now let's look at more general. When you look at a system right here, you could have any crazy combination of X and Y in both these slots, autonomous, not depending on T. And you have a critical skill to learn in sections one and two and three. And that is, can you tell the difference between the parametric representation of a solution and the components, rabbits and foxes parametrically drawn as a cycle and rabbits and foxes cycling independently? The blue and black curve, make up this red cycle in the phase plane. And we already said last hour, blue must be rabbits because the blue peaks, foxes are getting happy. They're growing tremendously. When foxes peak, rabbits are running for the exit. Um, I'm being a little bit too colloquial. They're dying. I didn't want to be so graphic. Here's the harmonic oscillation. Can you tell which is velocity and which is position? Well, here the position is swinging quite wide. I think blue is position and V is velocity. But can you tell by this lagging effect when V velocity is highest, that must be when that 
equilibrium, when that mass is shooting through the equilibrium, yes, the position is zero. And when the velocity is, excuse me, lowest, when the velocity is zero, excuse me, what must be the displacement of that mass? As far from the equilibrium as possible. Get used to looking at pictures in the phase plane, individual pictures, and matching what they look like. If I covered up one side, could you draw the other? And the answer is yes, qualitatively, both directions. If I covered up the left, you should be able to draw it from the information on the right and vice versa, qualitatively at least. Here's the rabbits and foxes with the block of the carrying capacity on the rabbits at two. Do you see how they cycle and stop? They kind of stabilize, they stabilize at that point. Do you know which one's a rabbit, which one's a foxes? Well, by where they stabilize. But you could also say foxes were black because when foxes peaked, rabbits were taking a dive. When rabbits were lowest, blue, Foxes were taking a dive. And that cycle continued on, even though it evened out. Here's the competing species model. Is it easier to tell here who is X and who is Y? Yes, basically, because X is lost. X's went to zero, Y's went to three. OK, there's always visual clues in this picture. That's what you got to pick up on. I want to show you the discussion in section three now. So today we're just walking through this transition from slope field to direction field. And I'm going to go to this section three problems or section three notes I wrote. And uh, let's get that nicely set up just tell you a few more things about harmonic oscillators. Now, harmonic oscillator, simple harmonic oscillator has no damping. And the equation is very simple. MA is equal to minus KY. The force on the mass is the restoring force of the spring. But what happens, and, and, and sometimes in physics you say that this way, the spring opposes displacement. When you try to pull this mass one way, the spring tries to pull back the other way. Let's add, in the old days, we used to call this a dash pot, but let's add a little piston on another wall. So we attach the mass to a spring, and on the other side, a piston like a bicycle pump that kind of damps the motion of the mass. This dash pot, this bicycle pump over here is called a damper or a damping. And the concept of damper, remember spring had a natural constant called K. Damping has a natural constant people commonly refer to as B. But whereas the spring opposes displacement, the damper opposes velocity. Go out in your garage, pick up your bicycle pump and try to close it very slowly. It's hardly gonna fight you at all. You can compress your bicycle pump slowly and meet very little resistance. But as you pump your bicycle, get up to 60, 70 pounds in that tire. You have to pump faster, you have to pump harder because the tire is pressing back at you. If you disconnected it to the tire and just tried to compress that bicycle pump by itself, it would oppose you compressing it quickly because you're crushing that air inside the pump and it has to escape, if not into the tire, then into the air. So when the mass is moving quickly, the damper is detracting from its velocity more. So spring opposes displacement, damper opposes velocity. And then in that way, now you have the equation, what we call the damped harmonic oscillator. This is the equation of damped harmonic oscillator. We can do our variable switch, V equals dy dt. And then A becomes dv dt. And we can rewrite that 
excuse me. There's our first order system. This is a famous first order system. This is called the damped harmonic oscillator. And we're going to study systems like this in great detail. Y represents position, V represents velocity, A represents acceleration. I rewrote them and solved for dy dt and dv dt so I could present it as a first order system. So I solve for dv dt by putting the two pieces bv and ky on the right and dividing by m. Remember, m is a positive constant. m, b, and k are positive constants. There are no springs with negative stiffness. There are no masses with negative mass quantity, and there are no dampers with negative damping, at least right now. Certainly, I'm not going to let you have a zero mass here. We could talk about other ways we could fudge this later. So what happens when I do that damping? I'm taking energy out of the system, right? What should it look like? Let's take a simple example where mass is one, damping is three, and stiffness is two. I'm not gonna talk about the units of mass, damping, and stiffness right now. You can look them up, you know, mass units. I'm not gonna argue whether kilograms or pounds is better. Newtons or pounds. Let's just talk about just some raw numbers. This is a second order equation. How did we solve that in section 1.8? We tried to guess the solution, right? We said, wow, an exponential could zero out. If I put an exponential in here and differentiated, differentiated, added copies, I could theoretically get zero. Trouble is I just don't know what exponential. So let's try an exponential with a variable called S. Derivative, second derivative, insert, Gather the common terms of e to the st. What do I have? Polynomial times e to the st equals zero, but exponentials are never zero. They're basic exponentials. But polynomials, wow, that's in my wheelhouse. I've done a lot of these. Quadratic equation, factoring, whatever you want to do, complete the square. Yes, this could be zero for two special values of s. And so my guess was not such a strange thing to do. If I set S equal to minus one or minus two, I get two different answers to the problem. I could physically check that they're answers by differentiating them and inserting them. Notice each one of these answers describes a position, Y is position. So differentiating them describes what? A velocity. Relatively simple to differentiate exponentials. And then let's look side by side at the solutions to the second order problem and the solutions to the first order system. So on the left, second order problem, I guessed solutions of e to the minus t and e to the minus 2t. On the right, first order system. And I can think of the yv pairs as vectors. The y1 and y2 solve the problem on the left, and the pairs y1, v1, y2, v2 solve the problems on the right, the system. This is, you commonly call this in mathematics, a duality or in plain English, a dichotomy. These are two things that are really the same. brought to you in a different presentation. These two problems look different, but they're actually the same problem. If I graph the e minus t and the e minus 2t, I see the exponential decay. If I graph these two vectors parametrically on the right, I see exponential decay to the origin. I'm not drawing vector field. I'm drawing two straight line solutions in the phase plane. So you need to train yourself to see the solutions on the left 
combining to make the solution on the right. Why do they combine? Because you could factor out an e to the minus t. And we left with a vector 1 and minus 1. You could factor out e to the minus 2t and be left with a vector 1 minus 2. We're going to wrap up now, but I want you to pay something special attention to these straight line solutions. As t goes on, y1, y2, v1, v2 decay to 0, right? That means if I started at 1, 1, as I move towards the origin, I'm moving forwards in time. In this case, because I'm doing exponential decay. If I'm starting at 1 minus 1, that must be when t is equal to 0. Plug t equals 0 in here, and you get these two starting dots. But on the other side, I'm not moving forward in time. I must be looking into the past. As I go behind that point, that must represent the t's that are negative. And that's true when t is negative. The negative exponential does what? Grows, but from right to left. Okay, good. So I want you to look at these drawings until you believe that they are the same. I want you to make drawings like this for yourself. You could make them in the Mathematica notebook. So the flow of the YV curves on the right is consistent with the direction field. You could draw a direction field for this problem and check. Okay, I'm gonna go and share one more screen with you. Stop it with those notes. This is, this is pretty much the only time in this course I would actually read notes to you because I prepared those notes specially with those graphics. So I want you to go out and work on this Mathematica notebook, putting in your systems, generating your images. And I also want you to look at these, share one more screen with you. I want you to look in our week two page here at these sample problems where I focus on drawing fields and such for you and explaining how the equations are represented in the fields. i give it a second to load right here. I don't like going to the external thing here because like I said to you earlier, Google Drive is a little bit slower. There's interesting, so I'm not gonna blow this up, but this is problem number 15 and you're doing a very similar one, problem 15 alt. Differential system produces some crazy waving in the plane. Can you read the clues to this crazy waving in the equation that you're given? Can you look at the crazy waving and see why it's consistent with this equation? Can you look at this equation and after a while start to predict this crazy, crazy way. This is random, this is not random. I've got, look at this, cycling out of equilibriums, but look at these other black dots. I've also got avoiding equilibriums. We'll know later exactly why this happens, but this week is dedicated to you learning to produce these graphics learning to interpret these graphics. Okay, I'm gonna hang out for a second, but I gotta to go to another meeting a little bit after two. So I appreciate your attention. Those three notes, notice I only have one page of notes here today, what we opened up and then we went to Mathematica. Those three sections of notes are on our website. I'll write this on the paper just to remind people that weren't here. But go and consume those notes again and see where we're going. Uh, if you have, let me turn off the recording. You can come and go as you like. And if you want to ask one more question, I saw there's a possible question here. <laughs>